This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Thank you very, very much for asking me to give a Howison lecture. I'm humbled by the list of 90 years of predecessors on this form, but I do have to begin by explaining my title. I'm talking about mathematics. I have a very folksy eye doctor who is a bit of a fan. He said to me he had read a book of mine and he gave me a marvelous compliment. He said, you write just like my third grade teacher told me to write. Never use a 10 cent word when a 3 cent word will do. Well, of course, proof, truth, hands, and mind are pretty expensive words, but they're no more than five letters long, much better than 11 letter words like mathematics. But why my title? First, because proof has been an essential part of Western mathematics ever since Plato. And Plato thought that mathematics was the sure guide to truth. I want also to think of how we do mathematics in a material way that Plato would hardly have acknowledged. We think with our hands and our whole bodies. We communicate with each other, not only by talking and writing, but by gesticulating. If I am thinking mathematically, I may draw a diagram to take you through a series of thoughts. And in this way, I pass my thoughts to you. I was astonished a short time ago when an established American poet, Kelly Cherry, wrote a poem, a sonnet, about me proving Gödel's theorem in a logic class some 50 years ago when I was a novice prof and she was a grad student. The poem describes me as covering all four blackboards in a room in Virginia with chalk, gesticulating the while. I still remember, she writes, how you started on one blackboard and worked your way around the room, four walls whited out in the blizzard of chalk. The concluding couplet of the sonnet runs, like gazing into someone's mind and seeing his thoughts, no two alike come into being. Not a very good poem, a book sent out of the blue, but it surprised me by expressing one of the connections between mathematics and the body that interest me. And hence my mysterious title, Proof, Truth, Hands, and Mind. But of course, there's much more to the connection between hands and mathematics than gesticulating. George Lakoff here at Berkeley has done much to make us aware of how so many mathematical concepts are, as he puts it, embodied. Mathematics is a specialist interest, yet it's the only branch of human knowledge that has consistently obsessed many of the dead great men in Western philosophical canon. Not all, by any means, but Plato, Descartes, Leibniz, Kant, Husserl, and Wittgenstein form a daunting array, and that omits the angry skeptics about the significance of mathematical knowledge, such as Berkeley and Mill, and the logicians, such as Aristotle and Russell. If I cast my eye down this list of Howison and lectures, I would add at least Michael Dummett, Hillary, Putnam, Saul, Kripke, and Quine to that list. And in the opinion of some, those are the most important Howison and lectures that you read on that list. Others would point to many more distinguished speakers who could care less about mathematics. And yet a certain ideology of mathematics has infected philosophy. The terms of the bequest of the Howison lecture, which you can read here, penned in 1919, use an idiom that few of us, or none of us, would use today. 
It tells us that Professor Howison thought of the world as a community of free persons, finite and infinite, sustained by a vision of the perfect. Perfect with a capital P. And where did this vision originate? In Plato's conception of mathematics. Why has mathematics mattered so much to so many famous philosophers? Aside from the naysayers such as Mill, it's first of all because they have experienced mathematics and found it passing strange. The mathematics they have encountered has felt different from other experiences of learning, discovery, or simply finding out. Now, many people do not respond to mathematics with such experience or feelings. They really have no idea what is moving those philosophers, and they're in good company. Take David Hume, one of my heroes who can do no wrong. I doubt that he had a mathematical moment in his entire life. Experience in mathematics in no way implies the possession of philosophical gifts or vice versa. But those philosophers who have experienced mathematics have built it into their conceptions of pretty well everything. So what is philosophy of mathematics? <coughs> there are three types of philosophical issues about mathematics. I call them ephemeral, scholastic, and perennial. The ephemeral ones are the pressing ones, arising out of recently discovered but disquieting mathematical facts we have not yet figured out how to live with. Ephemeral doesn't mean unimportant. It means present, but perhaps not long-lasting. Most generations during which mathematical research has been intense produced their own ephemeral philosophical difficulties. Mathematicians worry about them just as much or more than philosophers do. What I call the scholastic issues, again, not with a negative sense, no more than ephemeral, are usually generated within philosophy itself and are almost unknown outside it. The perennial questions are for everyone, including and maybe especially including beginners. There are a few topics that are easily grasped if you have any live experience of mathematics at all. They've always been there, and they're not going to go away. I have no intention of making them go away. I shall touch on the ephemeral, but more briefly than I would like. The issues really matter to how we should think about mathematics now in 2010, but they're not my primary topic. I shall sketch a few, because it seems to me that far too many philosophers of mathematics intent on scholastic issues tend to ignore pressing matters arising from current math. In contrast, I shall bypass what I call scholastic matters, and so this talk will not much resemble most current literature in the field of academic philosophy. Instead, I shall strive for a second adolescence and address perennial questions, which, in my opinion, are the reason why there is philosophy of mathematics at all. Second, adolescence. I've written far too many books, but not, published almost nothing about mathematics. Yet it was my first love. My PhD thesis came in two parts. One was called proof, the first word of this lecture. The other of 30 odd pages had nothing to do with it but proved some results in logic. Happily, the examiners liked the latter and they passed me. But I have been gnawing at the topics of the other thesis, proof, all my life. And I finally venture, 50 years later, to continue writing that thesis. And the talks I am giving this week, including this one, are different aspects of that project. I have been quietly obsessed by Wittgenstein's remarks on the foundations of mathematics ever since I bought the book on the 6th of April, 1959. And my dissertation was a first passionate, confused expression of the effect of that book on an as yet unformed mind. If Professor Chihara is present tonight, he can witness that I was impassioned with the remarks when we were both 
very young and knew each other very briefly. I do, however, take up new topics, which it would have been hard to think about 50 years ago. Proof. I want to say something about the first word in my title. Proof has been a hallmark of Western mathematics descended from Greece. There was plenty of what we can recognize as mathematical thought in ancient China, Egypt, Babylonia, possibly in Mesoamerica. We might venture this. As soon as a people had invented writing, they were ready to invent mathematics, and maybe the Inca did it without inventing writing. But writing enabled us to tap cognitive skills in ways very difficult without it. But the existence of proofs is a due to a curious historical accident. A handful of people in the, Medi ancient Medi in the Eastern Mediterranean, Greeks as we call them, discovered the very possibility of deductive proof. They happened to live in an argumentative society, a few of whose members wanted a better tool for settling arguments than rhetoric. I want to remind you of Kant's story of this. Were heirs to this critical anomaly in human thought. In the traditional story relayed by Aristotle, a legendary Thales discovered proof, and all the greats repeat what Aristotle passed on. It's not terribly good history in our present opinion, but it's an important parable. A short time, Kant, a short time after publishing the first edition of the Critique of Pure Reason in 1781, Kant caught the wave of the future, something not often noticed, and became something of a historicist about human reason. The new introduction to the second edition of the first critique, 1787, pure reason has a history. I love his rendering of the story of the light bulb going on over the head of Thales or some other. He writes, in the earliest times to which the history of human reason extends, mathematics among that wonderful people, the Greeks had already entered upon the sure path of science. The transformations must have been due to a revolution brought about by the happy thought of a single man. The experiment which he devised, marking out the path upon which the science must enter, and by following which secure progress throughout all time and in endless expansion is infallibly secured. You didn't know Kant did, went in for purple prose, perhaps. And he speaks about how the history of this intellectual revolution has been preserved uh, in a way which at least shows that the memory of the revolution brought about by the first glimpse of this new path, must have seemed to mathematicians of such outstanding importance as to cause it to survive the tide of oblivion. A new light flashed upon the mind of the first man, be he Thales or some other, who demonstrated the properties of the isosceles triangle. Now, of course, we would not do all this. It requires a community. We would not do a single man and all that. But there's a remarkable. Uh, parable here being told by Kant. Uh, in the uh, opinion of one of the most interesting historians of mathematics revealed, of Greek mathematics revealed, Nets, something tumultuous took place involving a small number of individuals who corresponded and traveled in the Eastern Mediterranean. Using the metaphor recently favored in paleontology, Nets suggests to quote, the early history of Greek mathematics was catastrophic, fantastic changes. A relatively large number of interesting results would have been discovered practically simultaneously. Now, maybe this is no more than a just so story, but it is a great parable. Like so many parables, it cuts two ways. In a brilliant critical notice of Netz's book, Bruno Latour has recently written Bruno Latour is a sociologist of knowledge, uh, the one who has most influenced my own thought, who says that Plato kidnapped mathematical proof, kidnapped, making it a cornerstone of his epistemology and metaphysics. And he's quite rude about Plato. To the great surprise of those who believe in the Greek miracle, the striking feature of Greek mathematics, according to Nets, 
writes Latour, is that it is completely peripheral to the culture, even to the highly literate one, medicine, law, rhetoric, political sciences, ethics, history, mathematics, no. With one exception, the Plato-Aristotelian tradition. But what did this tradition, itself very small at the time, take from mathematics? Only one crucial feature, that there might exist one way to convince, which is apodictic and not rhetoric or sophistic. Philosophy extracted from mathematicians, not a full-fledged practice, but only a way to radically differentiate itself through the right manner of achieving persuasion, which he thinks is, which of course Latour thinks is all a con trick. And Latour speaks for myriads, who say that they hate or fear mathematics. If you had to suffer through geometrical demonstrations at school, which is certainly the case for me, he writes, and so on. Now, I'm in the minority. In fact, I am lucky enough to have gone to a mediocre high school long ago, a rather unreformed place where I had to do slightly watered down Euclid. And in my case, it was at the age of 13 or 14. Nerd I was, so I loved Euclid. It was my escape from a harsher world around me. I learned about proofs, and I loved them. So I am a gullible victim of Plato's ad ad abduction of mathematics and a victim of Kant. But do we need proofs? The little sketch I've given is of highly contingent events, flukes of happenstance. We have, by good fortune, an experimental illustration of that. China, in ancient times, developed brilliant mathematical ideas. But it chiefly worked on a system not of proofs, but of approximations. Proof seldom reared its head and was seldom esteemed in its own right. Jeffrey Lloyd, the historian, comparative historian of Chinese and European intellectual history, suggests the hierarchical structure of a powerful education system with the emperor's civil service as the ultimate court of appeal, had no need of proofs to settle, it, settle anything, whereas a democratic, very oligarchic, but I mean very limited in the democracy, democratic society like Athens, where you had to argue things out, at least to an anti-democrat like Plato, proof was a wonderful replacement for rhetoric. We could have got on just fine without proof, we could have been Chinese using a sophisticated method of approximate solutions and got ourselves to the differential calculus that way, directly. If we had fast computers long ago, who would have needed proof? I don't support that line of thought about what we could have done because I think proof is so intimately Im embedded in the history of the Western sciences as a model, often for the worse rather than for the better. But uh, I, we could, could, just could have done without the concept and practice of deductive proofs, but that's where we are. That's what we have, and we still have it. Now, I was once keen on proofs, but then let them rest. But there are advantages to being Rip Van Winkle. Rip slept for only 20 years, which happened to span the American Revolution. I'm a Rip who has stayed away from mathematics and its philosophizing for no fewer than 50 years. Hence, I am struck by some radical changes that may escape the notice of those who have come upon the scene more recently or have been able to watch it evolve continuously. There's, of course, a lot more mathematics. There are not just new questions, but new classes of problems and new methodologies, new techniques pretty much unthinkable until quite recently. I think it's not just a matter of degree, but it doesn't matter. Rip Van Winkle has difficulty catching up on the new math, but he easily notices changes in the way in which mathematicians of various sorts talk about their field. He attends to the new gossip. I shall single out four changes as done deeds. Certainty, kinds of evidence, experimental mathematics, and application. These lead on to what I have called ephemeral issues, important topics that arise from mathematics as she is practiced right now. Certainty. Mathematics used to be admired as the only certainty. 
Any of you who have read Bertrand Russell's biographies or autobiographies will know what he vowed as a young man to make mathematics completely certain. Mathematicians have finally allowed themselves to be relaxed about what would once have been scandal. Published proofs are full of gaps, even though the result proved is usually more or less right. One mathematician, Richard Borchardt of the math department here, he won a Fields Medal in 1998, casual asked me, casually asked me at our first meeting, after we had discussed his own work, if anyone had looked at the error rate of the proofs in Principia Mathematica, especially volume three. The very concept of an error rate in published proofs was, to my knowledge, non-existent or unmentionable 50 years ago. Now it's a commonplace anywhere. Once it seemed a terrible insult to the queen of the sciences that proofs are full of holes. Experts now expect that and accept it so long as one sees pretty clearly how to clean up the odds and ends. Sometimes it matters and the proofs are deeply fallacious. In important cases, one worries. But in general, certainty has become a matter of degree. These thoughts have become common parlance. During the last 50 years, the old vision of absolute mathematical certainty, which Kant took for granted and which drove Russell to spend the best years of his life toiling with Whitehead on Principia, they're all history. Second, kinds of evidence. It's now publicly acknowledged that all sorts of evidence may be used in support of mathematical propositions. Proofs are important. Perhaps they still define the discipline, but the working mathematician uses all sorts of non-demonstrative reasoning. A nice example of sheer hands-on experimentation is in packing problems. What's the best way to fit a bunch of tetrahedra into a container, which actually has a lot of important applications? People do that with real little plastic objects pieces from Dungeons and Dragons are the cheapest tetrahedra in town. And they also do it by computer simulations. More generally, there is a widespread awareness that demonstra demonstrative proof is not as important as it seemed to be. George Polia, in 1945, had already shown that all sorts of non-deductive good reasons arise in mathematical thought. Polia's one-time student, Imre Lakatos, wrote his brilliant proofs and refutations to show that all mathematical proofs are fallible. The procedure of proof is what he called quasi-empirical. Only at the end of a Hegelian synthesis of proof and refutation might one produce something that amounted to analyticity. But it's not Lakatos that made mathematicians, or Polia, that made mathematicians come out of the closet about fallibility. There's a much richer internal story that demands serious sociological study one thing with which it's connected is the most radical single change to have occurred in mathematics these 50 years, namely fast computation. This has become an almost invaluable tool for mathematical exploration. In the early days, computers were merely prosthetics, sort of a better pencil. What matters today are how computers help us to explore. So experimental mathematics, there's been a lot of discussion by both mathematicians and philosophers about proofs checkable only by computer and about computer generated proofs. The prime example to which philosophers usually turn is the four color th theorem proved in 1977. Far more important in my opinion is the advent of large scale experimental mathematics with its own journal, Experimental Mathematics founded by David Epstein in 1992. David just happens to have been one of my undergraduate chums. To avoid misunderstanding, it was emphasized from the start that this was a journal of pure mathematics. The point was not to deny the claim that I shall make about pure and applied mathematics in a few moments, but to make plain that the journal was not interested, for example, in the booming industry of simulating experiments in the material world an activity that depends, of course, on the constant use of mathematics, both in modeling the micro and macro universes around us. 
but also in designing programs in which the models are embedded. Thus far, most philosophers seem to have discounted experimental mathematics as nothing new. I think not enough attend to the way in which it is such an extraordinary tool for mathematical exploration. Perhaps an awoken Rip Van Winkle can arouse his colleagues from dogmatic dozing. How about this for a sentence destined to rouse hackles? Experimental mathematics provides the best argument for Platonism in mathematics. At any rate, as David Epstein wrote me recently, these are things that no one dreamt of when we were students. Sometimes what is found out is quickly replaced by a deductive proof. Some of those deductive proofs are old fashioned proofs that make sense. Others are themselves only machine checkable. Here there is a real division of attitude. Some mathematicians regard computers merely as tools of discovery or as search machines for counterexamples. After discovery comes justification. Others think this attitude is obsolete. I don't take sides. Mathematicians differ. Timothy Gowers, a Cambridge mathematician who won a Fields Medal in 1998, same year as Richard Butchard's, is the author of a wonderful book, Mathematics, a Very Short Introduction in which he writes, my own view, which is a minority one, is that over the next 100 years or so, computers will be eventually supplanting us entirely. But he continues, most mathematicians are far more pessimistic, or should that be optimistic, about how good computers will ever be at mathematics. Incidentally, and perhaps it is relevant, I have encountered very few working mathematicians who take Wittgenstein seriously. Gowers writes at the end of his little book, anybody who has read both this book and the philosophical investigations will see how much the later Wittgenstein has influenced my philosophical outlook, and in particular, my view on the abstract method. But now with computers, we enter a strange region. We tend to think of computers as never making mistakes, but computers are imperfect and their error rate is far greater than their manufacturers acknowledge. This has become a little branch of mathematics in its own right. For um, exaggeration, Roger Penrose argues that all computation is a quantum sensitive operation. That is, it's probabilistic only. It only takes a co one cosmic ray to turn a zero into one and make a different computation. So here is a, one more ephemeral problem, which of course might go on troubling us for a very long time. Applications, another change. There was in 1960, something of a Cold War division of opinion. Soviet dogma held that pure mathematics was bourgeois idealism, and that only applied mathematics was substantial. But in the West, where what we call the philosophy of mathematics was practiced, the concept of pure mathematics was dominant, not only among philosophers, but among many schools of mathematics. It was a curious situation, for never before had mathematics such an effect on the world. In 1960, everyone was aware of the possibility of blowing everything up and was busy digging futile bomb shelters or walking from Aldermaston with the campaign for nuclear dis disarmament. Perhaps that was the very reason that mathematicians, ostrich-like, wanted to maintain their purity. I believe that the sharp distinction between pure and applied mathematics was an aberration that has passed. A lovely end of career account of the reunion of pure and applied is to be found in a recent survey article called Geometry and Physics by Mac Michael Attia, who won his Fields Medal long ago and an Abel Prize recently. The doors between pure and applied have been unlocked. Mathematicians have had to learn how to think like physicists. Not only metaphorically unlocked, but literally in Attia's case. It seems that when he was at MIT, he discovered that a door separating mathematics and physics was permanently locked in the building or the extended building in which he worked. <laughs> Why? 
Well, the physicists had just installed new carpeting and didn't want the grubby mathematicians messing it up with muddy snow on their boots. Peter Gallison tells of a contretemps that can ensue when the mathematicians and the physicists get different answers. In his example, the physicists were right. Their sense of how the physical world works trumped the mathematicians' conception of space. In retrospect, one just says that somebody made a program er error, but that is really not to get at the heart of it. I'll give just one example of how the boundaries between pure and applied sort of collapse. It's a real life example, quite easy to understand. It's rigidity. Nothing, it seems, could be more practical than rigidity. As humans, soon as human beings began to build shelters, moved out of caves, they wanted structures that would not fall down. Some predecessor concept of rigidity must have emerged very early in human consciousness, not as a cognitive universal, but as an ecological one. Take only a very late civilization about which we actually know something. The two classic structures of the North American prairie, where building materials are scarce, are the wigwam and the teepee. The former, the wigwam, is a fairly permanent structure in which hide is fixed around a dome frame made of branches, and the latter, as you know, is built around a movable frame of poles that becomes rigid when erected. Now, there's a wonderful mathematics of rigidity. Some say it goes back to Euclid, but in 1814, Cauchy, the French mathematician, proved the foundational theorem that any convex polyhedron with rigid plates, but with hinges at its edges, is, despite the hinged edges, rigid. Here we move from a serious practical problem, what stays up, to pure mathematics, an entire discipline, which becomes an aspect of topology develops. But then real life strikes back, and the mathematicians learn from the engineers. One of the loveliest rigid structures is the geodesic dome, often called the Bucky Dome, after Buckminster Fuller who worked out some of its principles and patented it in 1954. It's a network of great circles that interform to triangles. Much of the same effect, by the way, seems to have been achieved by wigwams built by Apache Indians. Fuller generalized the concept of rigidity to what he called tensegrity, tensional integrity, based on a balance between tension and compression which has a lot of engineering consequences, both in the large and the small. That is totally applied science. But tensegrity has generated its own rich and aesthetically pleasing field of mathematics. Late in the 19th century, a French engineer, I emphasize engineer, discovered flexible non-complex polyhedra. But it was long thought that any polyhedron homeomorphic to a sphere has to be rigid. In 1978, Robert Cornett Connolly at Cornell found a flexible 18-faced 11 vertex counting counter example. Does this research have practical consequences? Not obviously. One application of Connolly's discovery is one can make a flexible polyhedron for exhibition. According to Wikipedia, there's one in the Washington one in Washington at the National Museum of American History. I don't know why it's not in the Smithsonian, but there. Well, that's an application which we should not forget in thinking about applications, what I call a secondary application, namely to enchant school children with the wonders of mathematics. Connolly's polyhedra are in familiar three-dimensional space. Flexible polyhedra are known in four space. Are there any flexible polyhedra in more than four dimensions? A question investigated at present for purely aesthetic reasons. The answers are not known. So it's pure for the nonce. I want also to say a word about the application of mathematics to mathematics. Um, Descartes uh, wrote the first canonical textbook of analytic geometry, the Geometrie. We often forget it was published as an appendix to the Discours, that is, the discourse of properly conducting one's reason and seeking the truth in the sciences. I like to think of his geometry as a model of how to conduct one's reason and seek truth. The geometry made plain, what had been glimpsed at before, for all the world to see that algebra, born of arithmetic, could be applied to geometry. It's the first indubitable example 
of the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics developed for one purpose applied to mathematics developed for another purpose. And I'm dead serious in making a statement parallel to the physicist Eugene Wigner's statement, 1960 article, Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. Wigner's title is often read as The Unreasonable Applicability of Mathematics to Physics. Descartes gave a stunning example of the unreasonable applicability of mathematics to mathematics. Now, why is it unreasonable? Because it's almost too good to be true. Geometry is spatial. Algebra is a child of arithmetic. Arithmetic is for counting, a process that, as Kant emphasized, takes place in time once you get past the point of just seeing how many, that is, past six or so. Kant used his thought of the distinctness of space and time, manifested by the difference between geometry and arithmetic, as the road to an entire critical philosophy that has haunted us ever since. It would be a plausible conjecture for those who take a modular view of the brain that the modules that enable us to navigate our spatial environment and invite geometry are distinct from those that gave us the number sense, to use the title of a book by Stanislav Dehaene. Somehow, the two coalesce. How come? Well, that's not an ephemeral question, but as a matter of fact, it's not one which philosophers have addressed. The history of mathematics is one of diversification and unification. We start with diversity. Some peoples, the ancient Greeks, fixed on geometry as primary, while others in India and working in Sanskrit fixed on numbers as primarily and bequeathed that obsession to Islam and Arabic. But it all keeps turning out to be the same stuff. And if you read science journalism, you'll know, for instance, that one of the reasons that Andrew Wiles's result on Fermat's last theorem is deemed to be so exceptional and create new proof ideas was that it brought together branches of mathematics which seemed to have nothing whatsoever to be do with, do with each other. But there's something special about arithmetic and algebra on the one hand and geometry in the other. Perhaps it's only a contingent fact about the historical development of mathematics as we know it. But there's a strange play of arithmetic and geometry throughout our experience. Descartes is a focal point in that dance. Category theory can be seen as starting from the premise that the two are the same and seeing what happens. So understood, it would be a fulfillment of a Cartesian insight that Cartesian geometry and algebra are win one. I think that the question about algebra and geometry is one that deserves much thought and which is not ephemeral, but it does not bear on my lead question. Why is there a philosophy of mathematics at all? First, Russell's answer. Why has mathematics exercised such a powerful effect? When he had finished and done with Principia, Bertrand Russell sat down to write a potboiler that has charmed young people ever since, the problems of philosophy in 1912. It charms me still. In the course of covering the waterfront, he wrote, every philosophy which is not purely skeptical must find an answer to Kant's question, how is mathematics possible? Of course, Russell exaggerated. Some great philosophies that are not purely skeptical have had no interest in mathematics whatsoever. What's so strange about mathematics that it should, however, attract so many philosophers? Russell mentioned one source of wonder, the apparent power of anticipating facts about things of which we have no experience is very surprising. That's a much better way of putting things than Kant's glorious exclamation of awe, the one that put together our philosophical argo. In the prolegomena to any future metaphysics that will be able to present itself as a science, that's 1783, between the first edition of the critique and what I call the historist, uh, historicist edition of the critique, uh, we get the question for the first time in Kant, how is pure mathematics possible? And it's a sort of shout. Here is a great and proved field of knowledge, which is already of admirable compass for the, and for the future promises unbounded extension, which carries with it thoroughly apodictic certainty, that is, absolute necessity, hence rests on no grounds of experience, and is a pure product of reason. 
and moreover is thoroughly synthetic. How is it possible for human reason to bring into being such knowledge wholly a priori? There we have the philosopher's words, a priori, synthetic, and qualified by adjectives that turn a noun into a sort of shout, apodictic certainty, absolute necessity. Yet that doesn't explain why so many philosophers should be obsessed by mathematics. The words are more names for aspects of an obsession than explanations of that, uh, that obsession. Proof and application when combined point to a reason why there has been a philosophy of mathematics ever since Plato. In fact, Plato is, I think, the first example of genuinely unreasonable uh, effectiveness of mathematics. In the 13th and last book of the Elements, Euclid constructed a regular convex polyhedron and proved there are only five of them. Some scholars have argued this is the conclusion which was the whole point of the Elements. We call these five polyhedra the platonic solids. In the Timaeus, Plato proposed that the elements of which the universe are built are shaped as regular solids. There was plenty of pre-Socratic speculative physics, but Plato took mathematics devised for supposedly aesthetic reasons and applied it to speculative physics. It may be the first known case of a primary and theoretical application of mathematics. At any rate, neither proof nor application suffices on its own to keep the ball rolling, but together they are a force which must be reckoned with. Yet something else is even closer to the experience of mathematical proof. It's the sensation that mathematics is just out there. And where is there? Well, that's a problem. But I take the sensation very seriously indeed. That's why I talk about the experience of mathematical discovery. It seems no more than a vulgar way of describing Platonism. Indeed, it may appear to be the most crass form of Platonism imaginable. It's the very crassness that brings it close to the roots of the philosophy of mathematics. Philosophizing about mathematics is haunted by Platonism, both naive forms and sophisticated forms. It's supposed to be a kind of ontology, but one is tempted to recycle Jacques Derrida's brilliant pun and call it hauntology. Until December the 5th, you can see the hauntology exhibit at the Bar Berkeley Art Gallery just off the street. And you can read phrases like, such an uneasy mixture of the ancient and the modern, which are applied to a particular form of uh, British jazz, or British music making, sorry. Uh, but one could apply the same thing to Platonism itself, an uneasy mixture of the ancient and the modern. Uh, I'm afraid to say the art gallery is cashing in on Halloween, and on fr next, this coming Friday, the 29th, they are having a sort of hauntology party. But I think hauntology is really a very serious idea. I'm not a Derrida admirer, but I think that pun is really enormously thoughtful. No ghost more effectively haunts all Western philosophy than Plato's, and sometimes I wish for an exorcist. Platonism, in its various guises and disguises, will never be exorcised. I find it best to say that in its strongest forms it is a pleasant fable, while in its more modest forms it's banal. One logician, Bill Tate, exemplifies the view that when properly stated, it is trivial. I do tend to agree with an idea I attribute to Nietzsche, that European languages demand an existential presupposition for the terms in the subject position. European grammars generate the feeling that if there are truths about numbers, then numbers exist. This Nietzschean idea is intended to undermine interest in the existence of numbers. Their existence is a trifling byproduct of our grammar. One can also say what the mathematician Timothy Gowers, whom I've referred to before, got from Wittgenstein, that it's what we do that matters, and in the way in which, much the same way in which the police in chess, the king's rook, is not an abstract object, it is rather what it can do which constitutes its reality. There are many scholastic positions here. 
Quine had what called the indispensability argument, which is supposed to settle the question, numbers and functions do exist because we quantify over them in the natural sciences. Quine's maxim, to be is to be the value of a variable. Numbers are values of variables in contemporary physics. That's our best available theory of how things are. Hence, numbers exist, which means that, in some sense, Platonism is true, QED. And there are widespread opposition to this. Hart, some of you will know Hartree Field or doctrines of fictionalism. Structuralism, advocated by Charles Sahara, among others, holds that what exists are not mathematical objects, but mathematical structures, and they exist. Nominalists think that's pretty cold comfort, and there's some truth in their reaction. Uh, there really is nothing more to numbers than their relations. So numbers, uh, any, so anything you say about numbers are about structures. And Plato need not have been very perturbed by structuralism. Uh, the numbers are characterized by certain structures, and there are structures instantiated by numbers. It's still a kind of Platonism. Now, I apologize for this gross superficiality, you experts. I want only to emphasize that these skirmishes and alarms are generated within philosophy itself. They're scholastic, not in any pejorative sense, but only in the sense that they are of interest to those who participate in the activity of academic analytic philosophy. Many mathematicians are content to call themselves Platonists. Is a single one of them moved by the fact that all the sciences quantify over numbers? I doubt it. They're moved by the fact that they discover amazing facts about numbers by means of proof or rumors of proof. At least some mathematical objects are experienced as out there, or structural relations between them are experienced as out there. What's this out there? It's convenient to use a debate in which a self-declared Platonist mathematician faced off against a nominalist neurobiologist. The protagonists were two French colleagues of mine, Alan Kahn and Jean-Pierre Changeux, published a book in French in 1880. 1989, and slightly expanded in English in 1995. Alan Kahn, who received the Fields Medal in 1982, cannot doubt there is a mathematical reality out there independent of human thought. Changeux is convinced that mathematical structures are byproducts of the innate endowments of the human brain. I suspect that these two attitudes are compatible but fortunately, Kahn and Changeux do not think so. Fortunate because some lines are drawn. I don't say they're drawn clearly, but clear enough that we can look at them. Kahn was enormously impressed with the fact about mathematical research. Here we come, he writes, upon a characteristic peculiar to mathematics that is very difficult to explain. Often it is possible although only after considerable effort, to compile a list of mathematical objects defined by very simple conditions. Intuitively, one believes that the list is complete and searches for a general proof of its exhaustiveness. New objects are frequently discovered in just this way as a result of trying to show the list was exhausted. Take the example of finite groups. The notion of a finite group is elementary, almost on the same level as that of an integer. A finite group is the group of symmetries of a finite object. Mathematicians have struggled to classify the finite simple groups. That is to say, the finite groups that, like the prime numbers to some extent, can't be decomposed into smaller groups. 15 years ago, this is 1995, the last finite simple group, the monster, was discovered by purely mathematical reasoning. It's a finite group with a considerable number of elements. Then he writes down the number of elements. It takes 54 digits to write down the number of elements. It's meaningless. It's now being shown, he continues, as a result of heroic efforts that the list of 26 finite simple groups is indeed complete. Now, Kahn writes as if the monster had been just sitting out there, quietly grinning, waiting for us to discover it. Now, there's a side tale here bearing on stuff about evidence and certainty and so forth. Uh, the person who demonstrated 
the existence of the monster, actually called it the friendly giant. Any mathematician still had doubts about the extent to which this fact had been proven. Uh, the fact, the existence of the monster and the completeness of the classification was actually not established till long after Kahn had written his those paragraph I quoted by Ashbacher and Smith in Caltech. That takes two volumes to prove the result. The reviewer, very knowledgeable Ronald Solomon in uh, the Bulletin of the American Mathematical Society, asserts that no single person will ever read the proof. But a team has checked it. That is, particularly the second volume is divided into five parts and five different people checked each bit of it. Yet Kahn, like many others, had no doubts about that fact, namely the existence of the monster and the completeness of the system of finite groups some 15 years earlier. A nice example of the way in which certainty in mathematics has just changed. Mathematicians soon made sense of the monster. That began with the prolifically creative mathematician John Conway with something he called the monstrous moonstein, monstrous moonshine conjecture. It seemed so preposterous it was called moonstein because the monster turned out to be identical to an object derived or, from a completely different branch of mathematics. It had to be a coincidence. There couldn't be any connection between these two completely disparate fields, moonshine. Except it was instead one of the cases of the underlying unity within the diversity of mathematics. But here I want only to emphasize Kahn's heart heart heartfelt feeling of experience that this at first sight absurd object was just there waiting for us. And it's quite a common reaction. Richard Borchardt's uh, one I mentioned before, got his Fields Medal for proving the moonshine conjecture. In conversation, he said, and he's allowed me to quote this, when you think about the monster, you have to wonder who made it. It's almost like that intelligent design stuff. The monster had such a complex and yet organized structure that it is as if it had been engineered by someone. Now he was exp honestly expressing his persistent astonishment about the sheer existence of the monster that he had proved to exist. He was not advancing, sorry, whose, whose properties, whose equivalents to something else he had proved to exist. He was not advancing an opinion. He was expressing heartfelt incredulity of a fact that in any ordinary sense, he understood at least as well as anyone else in the world. He was not so much surprised at the fact as by the existence of such a fact. He doesn't, of course, imagine the monster had a designer. He said only the object is so complex and so delicate in all its parts that it's, it, as if, is, it is as if it had been designed. And Kahn was giving vent to the same sentiment. But one may feel that he was also using a certain sort of mathematician's rhetoric to scare us into submission. It didn't work on his fellow debater, Jean-Pierre jean, -Pierre jean who said the monster was just a bore. So we're presented with this meaningless sequence of 54 digits. We can see that it actually factors into some very interesting primes up to 71, which are called the super singular primes. But all the same, one is reminded of Wittgenstein's remark about glitter. We're supposed to be impressed when Kahn writes down the number, but somehow it's overdone. Instead, we're offered what Wittgenstein called mysteriousness. In the same context, he asks, is it already alchemy that mathematical propositions are regarded as statements about mathematical objects and mathematics as the exploration of these objects? That is, Wittgenstein is saying, look, this would be that the whole thing is a confidence trick. It's that alchemy that Kahn takes for granted and which he presents as awesomely mysterious. Mystery, glitter, and alchemy, Wittgenstein's words, are not all the same, but all three of these words can be used to refract different aspects of examples like the monster. Wittgenstein himself said, all I can do is to show an easy escape from this obscurity and this glitter of concepts. I don't believe there is an easy escape from this obscurity and glitter of concepts of the sort illustrated by Kahn. 
Maybe there is no escape. It just is astonishing that a few elementary axioms for groups should generate this extraordinary object, which turns out to be related to a lot of other things and some people claim is even significant for quantum field theory. Kuhn is not an indiscriminate Platonist. He does not think that all mathematical objects are like the monster, grinning and waiting to be found. His idea has more content than Quine's semantic doctrine that if we quantify over any class, then entities of that kind exist. He's a highly discriminating ontologist. He agrees that most of the tools devised by mathematicians are inventions, not discoveries. His label for such tools is projective. But they are used to investigate what he calls, strange word, it's really French, archaic or primordial mathematical reality. This is his way of expressing a realism about ma mathematics that is both modest and specific. We construct mathematical tools at abundance, he writes, but what's remarkable is that using them, we can identify uniquely various objects that are not, in his opinion, constructed. They constitute archaic, primitive, original mathematical reality. And at least the integers, <coughs> in his judgment, are a familiar part of that reality. I don't share Kahn's con con convictions, but I find them more in in instructive than blanket scholastic Platonism, which says without discrimination that abstract objects exist or anything over which we quantify exists. The Nietzschean use of grammar to undermine Platonism is a powerful tool against the blanket, but not against Kahn. But there's the neurological retort, neurobiological retort. Jean-Pierre Changeux holds that mathematical truth is constrained by the neuronal structure of the brain. In answer to Kahn's example, he retorts that here we have merely, I would say glittering, um, an exotic example of the finite list of regular polyhedra, which so impressed Plato. And he writes, that does not prove, despite Descartes, that we are concerned with properties that are immutable and eternal. Here he speaks as the neurobiologist who doesn't really experience mathematical proofs. We can easily imagine a lost dialogue in which Socrates used the platonic solids to make the same point, almost word for word, that Kahn was making. He was merely choosing an example that was, in 1989, still recent and indeed unfinished business. My own opinion is much more obscure than those of either of the two controversialists. I think that what Kahn says is right, but what he means is wrong. He means a fabulous domain of numbers, archaic and primordial, whose structures have nothing to do with the brain. I think that what Changeu says is wrong, but what he means is right. He means that the structures Kahn so admires are byproducts of our genetic envelope. Both men engage in a debate that could be called archaic in a technical sense of the word if Greeks before Thales had discovered proofs. In fact, this debate is merely ancient and Athenian. It began at the time of Plato. It has stage props of today, the newly discovered monster, and recent findings in cognitive science pitted against it. It's nevertheless the perennial debate it is one of the two underlying reasons why we have philosophy of mathematics at all. The other is the sense that somehow, by proof, we discover that which is necessarily true. Thank you very much.